to the Exhaust Notes Podcast. What is good, everyone? Welcome back to the Exhaust Notes Formula One Podcast, the official Formula One podcast that you need in your life. Wait a minute, that's a different podcast. This is your new favorite Formula One podcast. I've got so many podcasts, I'm mixing up the slogans. So, as you can see, I've got Rowett, I've got Todd, and we've got Trevor with us this week to talk about, well, we're going to start off with Canada, but before we get into that, what's good, guys? How are y'all doing? We get it, Nick. You're popular. <laughs> and yeah, awesome. Congrats on the friends. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know I had my own podcast network. I just was kidding. It's called the Nick Engvall Cinematic Podcasting <laughs> Universe, first of all. <laughs> uh, it- and much like Kevin Feige, he wears a baseball hat every time I see him. Yeah. So the funny part about it is, I just I just basically don't have a, a life outside of the internet. So like, I record podcasts every week, every day of the week. <laughs> you and the rest of humanity, apparently. Uh, you know, I try. Maybe we can get popular enough to where we could just do an NPC Formula One podcast. Uh, do you guys know what NPCs are? No. What's NPC? This is going to be a rant that's not related to Formula One at all, but I'll tie it back, I swear. Right. There's some girl that just does, like, live streams on, like, TikTok or something like that. I don't even know what platform it is, but people pay her to act out emojis. Oh, I heard about this. And she just, like, one of them is Gang Gang. That was the one I remembered. Um but she'll be like, gang, gang, ice cream so good, ice cream so good, gang, 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 gang. And they, people literally send her money to like act this out while she's popping uh, popcorn kernels with a flat iron or like a hair flat iron thing. Wow. So I, we could just do that for like Formula One. We'll just like, if anybody can do impressions of like an old V10, that would be a great start. I was ready for you to say any word after popping when it said that girl's popping, and I was like, "What? What are we doing, pussy?" Like, <laughs> we're, no, we'll get to the only fan section at the end of the episode. Yep. So we had it. We had to bring Trevor on because last week I don't know if anybody caught this, but Todd somehow I think he blacked out and just totally took shots at Canada for half the episode, which you know we can't be doing that, Todd. Just I because did. you don't like Lance Stroll doesn't mean everyone from Canada is bad. It, first of <laughs> all, I feel like a uh, citizen from a, like a natural citizen of Canada from another country. If that makes any sense, I love Canada. Hockey's my favorite sport, but we can't. It's not even that I dislike Lance Stroll. I dislike the fact that he's the son of a billionaire. That in. Any, if he was any other driver on the grid, he'd have been replaced. He's seven or eight years deep in Formula One now. I have said many times, the guy turns into Ayrton Senna in the wet. <laughs> but in a dry track, he just has a habit of running into other cars. That's it. That's all he said. Your, ca- your Canadian apology was hilarious because at any point I was expecting you to say, I have many friends that are Canadian. <laughs> Much like a racist has many friends. <laughs> My main, my main, uh, my main argument just came from the uh, the swiping that you just uh, you just took uh, your drive bys on Lance Stroll last last episode. So I just wanted to kind of defend defend the flag a little bit and just uh, just remind you that uh, Lance is still ninth in the driver standings and uh, your boy Fernando Alonso only finished ninth today. So. He's he's hanging in his uh, their car is going backwards, but he's uh, he's doing okay. Although Oscar is gonna gonna fly by him here soon. Trevor does make a yes. good point. Alonso has definitely been going backwards. Well, I think the car has right. They were what P nine a P nine and P ten today. So like, bravo on Lance for being the same pace as Alonso. But the car in general was fighting for podiums consistently in the first five races, and now they're lucky if they're fighting for the scraps at the end of the top ten. Well, I think early on in the season, the biggest revelation was how good the Aston Martin car was and how front-loaded the car seemed to be and how that seemed to be really good for a driver like Alonso. And, you know, he obviously took advantage and – you know, had a bunch of seconds and thirds and 
you know, he's way up, he's still way up in the driver standings, but maybe that didn't work for Lance. Maybe Lance underperformed a little bit, but you know, he still brought home points, you know, at a decent clip. He's not a disaster. I think we can say that, you know, there's other drivers on the grid underperformed. And, you know, I think that Nick did a good job of defending him saying, you know, he's 25 years old, you know, he's not a, he's not a finished product yet. And yeah, he might not ever win a world title and he probably won't, but he's still, you know, a top 10 formula one driver as currently situated. And to be fair, I also kind of defended Nick DeVries, which in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have. You're just a softie. (laughs) But let's let's stroll back a second. You think Lance Stroll's a a (laughs) top 10 Formula One driver? He's ninth in points right now in a car that's not going anywhere. So... Uh, equal machinery. I know this is impossible to do in in Formula One, but equal machinery. You'd put him. You'd and you had to pick ten drivers out of the current grid. You'd put Lance in there. Well, I, I know you'd put Danny Rick first and Max second, and then the grid would continue down. But no, I do think that. I don't even know if I would take Danny Rick in the top ten, and I we've established how much okay, I love this. Okay, that's man. fine. So let's let's agree to disagree and put Lance at. 13th or 14th on the grid as far as cur- current current okay. drivers go that's that's fair okay acceptable so, peace, peace treaty. treaty bro do you have any do you have... <laughs> i feel like that was the most canadian resolution we could have gotten in this where it was just a, a bunch of carefully measured and slightly raised voices but everybody agreed everybody <laughs> Shook hands verbally, and you know what? Viva la Lance. <laughs> I'm gonna say. I'm, I mean, I'm honestly surprised that Todd. No, I'm gonna send Todd like three. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, direct messages later tonight. So <laughs> he's not. Yeah. The, the, the best part is that even if Trev and I were like legitimately arguing over over Lance like it would be totally squashed in a day and he would be like we'd be sending each other tennis shoes back and forth that's that's what and we Tim do. Hortons I wish he could send me Tim Hortons no but I mean I think the thing is this I have also kind of been a part of the Lance renaissance the Lancesance if we want to call it that um I still think he's gonna outpoint Charles Leclerc because Ferrari continues to be a shit show but that's my hot take that I didn't even think to put down but at this rate to your point, Trev, they are kind of backsliding. Is this more a fact of basically who's going to be able to be the most competent driver out of the four is going to win that two-way constructor bid in terms of who's going to finish ahead? Or is Ferrari that, or has Aston Martin got that far of a lead ahead of Ferrari that it doesn't even matter as they're backsliding at well, this rate? I think, we've, I think we're at the point now where some teams – are prioritizing 2024 versus 2023. And I get the impression from Ferrari that, or sorry, from Aston Martin, that they're they're prior to prioritizing 2024 already. I think they're happy where, where they're at. I think uh, the fact that Alonso is still third in the driver standings and he might slide down to fourth or fifth, I think they're going to take that and try to hit hit the ground running next year with a, a, a super advanced version of this year's car. So that's what I would suggest will probably happen through the second half of the season. So I'm going to follow that up because last week, I believe it was last week, it might have been the week before, we talked a lot about where Aston Martin goes from here, right? Like where do you see Aston Martin in like two seasons? Is it still Stroll and Alonso? Well, I think it's still Stroll and Alonso as long as Alonso wants to keep racing in a Formula One car. I think if Alonso steps out, then, you know, as Todd would say, 
Daddy Stroll will open up the the bank and pay whoever he wants. But I do think the development of that car and their facilities means that you know they want to play in that second, third, fourth, fifth tier of cars rather than the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth tier of cars that they've they've competed in in the past. Yeah, I think I think the other interesting thing is is it the new facilities that they're building are are ready for next season or ready for the following season? Do you know Todd? They come online at the end of this year and they're going to start doing correlation cuz like the biggest hurdle to get over um for for any wind tunnel really is to correlate the wind tunnel data to the CFD ta- data to the on track data. Like, you know, when they put those big arrow rakes on the car, yep. they want to see the same results of like the, you know, fluid wind or whatever. I don't know. It's not a technical term. I don't even know what they call it, but they want to see the same results across all those, all three of those. And then on top of that, if they're expecting a certain level of performance from a, uh, development, they want to see it across all three of those as well. So they were saying, at least from what I was reading, is that there it's going to probably take the balance of like next season to make sure that they have all that lined up. And then to answer your question uh, that you directed at Trevor, Nick, I think I believe Lawrence Stroll when he says he wants to like he's on a five year plan and he wants to win a championship in the next five years like I think Trevor was probably underselling it a little bit I think he wants to be at least one of the big three at worst I should say one of the big three and actually fighting for a championship against Mercedes against uh, Red Bull it's kind of interesting because if you look at the way this year is playing out McLaren maintains this new pace which I don't know. I don't really see any reason not to believe that they can't at this point. And Aston Martin comes up, you know, in the next season, season and a half. You're really going to have like four teams because, you know, Mercedes and Red Bull are not going to go away from the top three or four spots. And Ferrari, you know, I mean, even today, like they didn't totally botch the strategy, but they botched the pit stop. So it's like. If they don't do strat, if it's not strategy, it's something else, and it just seems like, like I just don't see them as a top three or four team anytime soon, unless unless they literally just come in and clean house, start over, and you know, to row its row its prediction last last week, I think was uh, you know, Carlos signs going someplace else, and you know, or even Leclerc going someplace else. I, I think going back to the constructor standing conversation, I really think it's a battle of Ferrari's ineptitude versus is Aston's car really done for the year, right? Because they, I, I know that they brought a development to it like a few races ago that didn't seem to work or, you know, slowed their pace down or whatever. Um, so either they haven't figured it out or they need to like revert back to what they were before. Is but there monetary the, uh, value at, at that, at like fourth, third, fourth, like what's the difference in like win money wise for these teams? I, th- I, I don't know the exact answer to this, but I remember people talking about, they were, um, they were asking like why Williams was battling so hard a, a year or two ago to try to get out from P10 to P9, and it was like a ten million dollar difference in prize money, Ooh. something like that. But that was for the very last place, and it obviously gets bigger from there. So, um, the, yeah, I I think it really comes down to how bad is Ferrari going to screw up their strategy versus is Aston's car really going to stay? Because Ferrari's car still feels at least a step faster than the Aston car, which I think we saw today because it was a pretty straightforward race. Like, they weren't really ever uh, in in trouble of falling back behind the Astons. So, I don't know. We'll see. But, yeah, Carlos signs the face of Audi, is uh, according to Rohit. Yeah. I don't see it, but I'd love it. 
Spanish driver hey, for a German else? company. Hey, there's a reason why the EU still stuck together in spite of Britain's insistence of leaving it. All right, this is a new dawn for a new day. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mick Schumacher. So gonna, he's going to have a resurrection with Audi, and he's going to be the perfect second place driver. Like that's him. Like, oh, you think he'd be a, a good uh, number two, uh, Carlos Sainz? I think he'd be a good reserve driver because I still think they're going to end up with either Checo Perez or a, a driver that is anguished to be named later. But at that point, like, I don't think Mick Schumacher is going to get that one season bump for going missing the way, like, let's say Esteban Ocon did when he was a Mercedes reserve driver. Like, I don't think people are clamoring in these streets for baby Schumacher. That's true. I think I think there's still I think he's still higher on a lot of lists despite not it being in, in a seat this year. Especially if Audi's, you know, if you're talking about Audi, right, there's always that kind of tie the driver to the country and, like, you know, especially coming in as a new team, you're going to have to mark it a little bit harder and push it a little bit harder than, than most of the teams. How sick would that be, too, to have, like, a German driver for the German company yeah. coming in? Well, as an Alpine fan, I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter because you can have two French drivers eating a croissant down the middle and they are going to crash into each one on one another and it's not going to do a hill of beans. I think they were just trying to save fuel and uh, stack up for 2024. I, no, so that, I mean, I gotta, since we're on the subject, i got to give a little slander to my boy real quick because everybody at the start of the race pinned it on Joe Guan Yu and it was his fault, right? He had a terrible start got overtaken like he lost i think like 11 positions in the start and then trying to make up or not get overtaken anymore super late on the brakes slid into uh the back of ocon i think ocon ocon was the one that went airborne also gasly he slid into gasly and then hit ocon yeah ocon came crashing down into gasly if i remember and i think that's when i stopped going to the discord and i was like well my day is done i'm abe simpson in that meme (laughs) but i have to say danny rick was slightly involved in that crash well kind of like not it wasn't a cause for it let's just say but he also had a bad start tried to take the inside track and i think was part of the reason that uh Joe cut so late on the brakes or didn't what well, didn't expect to have a car there cuz he cut Danny Rick tried to take the inside and he was like, "Oh crap, there's a car right in front of him." So, come on. Come on, honey badger. You're better than that. But so, hey, th- P13 to P18, back to P13. Not a terrible day on his his debut race back. Listen, as long as that man's involved, he can do no wrong in your eyes. He could literally crash all the other cars, and you'd still somehow put it, pin it on Lance Stroll, and then we'd have <laughs> Trevor come on for part two. That's not true. I I am hard on uh, Danny Rick when it when it needs to be. The funny Sad. thing is, is I don't think I don't I, I don't want to speak for you, Trevor, but I don't think Trevor has the same. Like, he doesn't have any kind of disdain for anyone the way Todd does for Stroll. So, like, no. like I think Danny Rick is still, like, an enjoyable driver for everyone else in the Discord, right? It, it seems that way to me. Yeah. I, I would... I don't know why this turned into disdain for Stroll. <laughs> let this be a, let, let go, this be go, a lesson to you, Todd. Just... Uh, just lay off on your uh, on your Canada slander. You got Latifi gone, but you're not going to get Stroll gone. So, <laughs> hey. all I have to tell you, Todd, is you could have ended that sentence after the word uh, after the word on, and we would have been like, "Yeah, that's Todd." That's fair. That's fair. Also, I did you got you, you, did you guys see uh, Latifi's life update? Yeah, a uh, week, week or so ago. I love it. Tell us, senior Nicholas Latifi correspondent Todd Yates, what has he done now? <laughs> no, he just said like he took forever off of social media, and it was like good for him, and he like went through a lot of abuse, and I think that was horrible. Uh, but he's like basically said like, all right, I'm done racing. I think he's going into like investment banking or something, or he's going he's to his MBA. school. Yeah, 
getting his MBA for it to go into like investment banking or something. That's so neat. good for him. I mean, you're already like in a family that's like basically a, the Sopranos of salami or whatever. So <laughs> uh, it's good for you. With a nickname to like more. that, with, with a nickname like that, why didn't he stay on the grid? The Sopranos <laughs> of salami. <laughs> I mean, he does give kind of AJ vibes, so I'm not mad at that comparison at all. But uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you guys about, specifically around the fact that we were talking a lot about the silly season, there were a couple of big rumors that came out this week from Joe Sayward. One was apparently Lando having a pre-contract with Ferrari. What do you guys make of that? Because that further fuels my fire that Carlos Sa- uh, Sainz is headed to uh, Audi. Well, can I can I just jump in here for a sec? Like Nick, Nick mentioned that Ferrari's going backwards, and I think it's a little bit premeditated to think that Ferrari's going to be an also ran in Formula One. You know, they've been there the longest. They've got humongous budget. You know, obviously with the changes in leadership there, you know, stuff is a little bit in flux. But you know, for, for a lot of years, Ferrari is spending you know 400 million on their on their formula 1 program. So I don't think that they're just going to accept being the 5th or 6th or 7th place team. Uh, they're going to fade away. I do think that there's still a lot of drivers on the grid who would be very happy being part of team Ferrari and you know even if Signs and Leclerc and you know move on you know, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that, you know, Lando Norris and Checo Perez are together on Ferrari in 2025. So I don't think we're shoveling dirt on them. They're kind of going through a little bit of a lull right now. But remember, last year they were the second best team on the grid. So I think they're, I think it's a little bit early to say that they're not going to be part of this, you know, big four, big five teams out there. <laughs> In I spite think of themselves. They were the second best team in spite of themselves. And I think none of them had that expectation going into the season to be the second best team. I think they were, to borrow another meme, since I'll be the meme lord of this episode, they were walking down that alley saying, here we go again, like ready for anything and everything. And they got a good season out of it, but I don't think they were that anticipatory in terms of being that high up, especially in the beginning where it truly looked like they might give a run for the money for Red Bull. I will say this. With that being said, I still think Albon makes the most sense as a number two driver for them. So I don't know why you go for Checo because in spite of today's performance, like is Checo back? Because I also feel like he's had a substantial backslide for the last couple of races. I think you're on mute. That's a good point, Todd. No. (laughs) It wouldn't be a... Exhaust Nuts episode if there wasn't a part where I was talking on mute. (laughs) Anyway, I was saying he definitely had a rough patch. Uh, He he missed Q3 for five consecutive races. And it did feel like a little bit, to plagiarize uh, Crofty a little bit today, it did feel like a little bit of a statement drive. Like, Checo, even at his best isn't known for like cutting through the field like that. And to do that on a track that is, uh, where he was starting further back and it's harder to pass on. He, he really like, I know the car was a rocket ship today. We saw Max win by half a minute, but, um, for him to on a, in a three stop race with, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of traffic, a lot of lap traffic to, to be able to make it up, up there was uh was pretty impressive so i want to i want to go back to the ferrari thing real quick because i definitely agree with trevor i don't i don't think that ferrari is gonna you know look they're always going to be a staple in formula one and i think if you look at things off the track i can't remember where i saw this we might be able to find an article and include it (laughs) in the links below but I'm pretty sure last year when they finished second, they hit all-time sales highs for streetcars, which, to Trevor's point, like the reason why they had those crazy budgets back in the day is because it was the closest, I mean, it's the most direct tie to 
the old saying of race on Sunday, sell on Monday, right? Ferrari is emulates that more than anybody. And I think because of that success, because of this, probably this influx of money that's going to come in and kind of re not reboot. It's not like they've fallen off, but I will say that like, just from a, a supercar market, you know, they've definitely Lamborghinis become like a, a talking point for younger, for the younger generation where Ferrari like has moved up in age with their clients and customers. Not that that's a bad thing, but when you think about that in the marketplace for buying and selling supercars, you know, that's an interesting piece to the puzzle. So I do, I do think that like, you know, like you could dismiss Ferrari. We can, we can say, yeah, they keep falling off, but like their falling off is rarely beyond the midfield, you know, like they're never towards the bottom of the pack. Like I can't remember the last time they were truly at the bottom. And I think that they'll have more money in this again, like seeing the sales on street cars and supercars, like, you know, that, that kind of stuff and that energy just drives the fan base. You know, it's like, I mean, I was actually at the Puma outlets this, this last week. And I don't know if you guys have looked at it, but the new Puma Ferraris, like F1 gear is beautiful. Like, I'm not a Ferrari like super fan or anything, but like definitely I'm going to pick some of that stuff up once it, you know, kind of gets marked down. Cause like it's cleaner than they've ever done it. You know, like most of the, of that kind of stuff has always been like a little bit too much for me. And I feel like those types of things just play into the energy of it. It's kind of like the, the energy of what drive to survive brought to the sport, you know, three years ago, the first time around or four years ago, whatever it's been. So, um, I, I, I'm I'm really actually excited to see how they like re, it, it, I don't even think the drivers are going to change. I think it's going to be signs and Leclerc next year. I think it could even go beyond that, but I think that they need to figure out who their like new leader is. Every other team has it and like every other successful team is like there's a very strong, passionate leader, well spoken towards everything, you know, like gets in the face of, you know, like kind of like Toto, Christian Horner, Zach Brown, like we see it with these other teams, right? Like even, even, you know, daddy stroll, like he's very passionate, like as a team owner, he's very outspoken. Ferrari doesn't really have that anymore. You know, like they haven't had it for a while. And I think that's what the missing piece is. And once they figure out who that is, I think they're probably right at the, right at the top two, three teams again, like every week. They need Gunter. I'll say it once. I'll say it again. They need Steiner. And it's just the cult of personality because I thought Fred Vassar would be a good hire. He's a professional. He gets things done. He's not going to cause a stink. In a way, he could be considered the rich man's Otmar or is Otmar the poor man's Fred Vassar. Like, we can have that discussion later. But both of them, due to the fact that they seem to be nice, normal human beings cut out for middle management, and now we're seeing them backslide, it's kind of crazy to me that it truly is the cult of personality that gets leadership over in this sport more than anything else. I'm going to jump in there and say, in response to what you guys are saying, like Ferrari will never be a back marker team. We could have said the same thing about Williams like a decade ago. If it's a good point. So let's, let's say it it's a not, good, it's a, it's, it's a good point, impossible. but I will say this. It's, it's not impossible, but I'm not a car nerd. You guys can strike down upon me with all the car nerd vengeance that you want, but was Williams ever held in the same standing that a Ferrari is? Hmm. In the Formula One world, absolutely. Yeah. They're the most, besides Ferrari, they're the most successful. But if I understood Nick's point earlier, wasn't Ferrari's whole ability to conjure up a Formula One team, the fact that they had these exclusive cars? So if you race on Sunday, it's to sell the car on Monday? Or is it a chicken and egg situation was where like the Ferrari Formula One car was so good that that's what sold the street Ferraris or vice versa. Like that's what I would kind of want to understand as a newer fan. I mean, I think that's a really hard thing to, to determine. Like Ferrari is so associated with fast cars and high performance cars because they've always won. Like they are like, I would, I would, the best way I could, I could put this for, for you as a sports fan, row it would be like, I would consider Ferrari the Lakers or the Celtics and I would consider Williams the Bulls, right? You know, the Bulls had an incredible run, five or six titles, but they're still not at 18 titles or whatever it is that, the you know, like Bill Russell, you know, had the famous, you know, I've got 
more rings than I have fingers type of thing. You know, that type of stuff is is kind of the way Williams was. Williams was like such a big deal for a while that to Todd's point, like if you would have asked me 15 years ago, I would have never bet against Williams because they were just always there. Right. And that team has taken huge tumbles, changed ownership. All, you know, the family is no longer involved. Like it's obviously a, a completely different thing. But the biggest difference between Williams and Ferrari is that Ferrari has a car business. Williams doesn't. Williams is F1, right? Like they don't really do much outside of Formula One, in my opinion, unless unless Todd, you know of anything. I don't think they even race outside of of F1 at all anymore. No, no. I, think I know they have at, at times yeah. tried other things, but yeah. yeah. It's interesting that you gave the the Williams the bulls because I would I understand what you were saying with like the the ultra successful you know lot lots of championships but not on the like Celtics or, or Lakers level, but I, it's funny when I think of Ferrari, I could equate them to the Bulls because of. What you were saying, which was the, the, um, like that whole win on Sunday, sell on Monday kind of thing, because like the Bulls and Jordan, right? And now we have yeah. still this many years on, we're still selling Jordans, like, or not we, but Jordan brand is still selling Jordans because of that one player, and it's almost morphed into its own thing. And I almost see Ferrari in that sense today. I agree with you before, it was like, You'd see the 250 GTO win at Le Mans way back when, and then they'd sell a crap ton of 250 GTOs. Today, it's no one, like kids nowadays that wear Jordans don't understand what Michael Jordan meant to basketball, really. Like, they, they might know just from the name, but they don't understand, like, really what, uh, like, an iconic figure he was. And I, fe- I feel like Ferrari is almost that same way at least for the younger generation, maybe like us and down, we're kind of old now, but you know what I mean? Like the younger generation, they see Ferraris as like flashy, you know, almost in a hype beast sense. And even though they're aware of the Ferrari F1 team, it's almost like its own separate entity. Like it's, there's not the automatic crossover like there used to be. It's either they're cool into flashy cars or they're into F1, it's not necessarily both. Yeah, I, de- I definitely think now is a little bit different. But I, that's why I brought up Lamborghini, because Lamborghini is the flashy car right now, right? Like, still, like, the last 10 years, like, if you were in New York City or L.A. or San Francisco, San Jose, someplace like that, where you were seeing supercars on a regular basis, you know, exponentially more Lamborghinis than ever before. And, like... They honestly had no correlation to their racing. They they have raced in sports cars, you know, like Le Mans and that kind of stuff. There's a bunch of like, you know, kind of like Porsche and Ferrari have their own kind of super. I forget. It's like Super Trofeo, I think, is the Lamborghini um, cir- not circuit, but group or whatever you call that. Spec race. Yeah, spec race. But like that never really was you know to your point that was never connected to the street cars necessarily right like people don't look at those and think oh i'm gonna go buy a lamborghini where like ferrari had like this legacy aspect of hey they raced they won and that was i think that's still a carryover for them for better or worse you know like they're probably looking at at their sales it's a little too far off tangent for formula one but they're probably looking at their sales and thinking how do we get the young kids to buy our cars? We've got all the old guys that have money buying our cars. You know, like the the the, the diehard Ferrari fans. You know, Ferrari does all the stuff to like keep them in the community the same way that Porsche does. Like they're both very good at embracing the people that have bought their cars throughout the years, take them to track days, take them around the world to experience different places, different you know different events, and I think that is. I think that's to your point. Yeah, like it is a little bit more separated now than it than it was. But I think that they're the only, in my opinion, them and McLaren are the only teams that like pass down that generational fandom the way that, you know, like Lakers fans, Celtics fans do. Right. Like, the, you know, Red Bulls is, is like kind of. You know, we've probably got a a, gener- a single generation over the course of this Red Bull team's life, right? Maybe. Um, and then you probably could look at Honda and, and connect those dots, but it's not something that they've stuck around for. 
you can kind of look at, you know, um, Mercedes, Mercedes, you know, doesn't have, they don't have like a heavy correlation between like streetcars and, and F1 at all, in my opinion. But I think that if there was a team that does, it's still Ferrari, you know, for the most part, McLaren probably saw the same kind of bump three years ago when they had a good, a good year, maybe this year, by the, by the end of the season, you're seeing, you know, Hey, people are buying, you know, new McLarens because of the formula one team. And because Lando, I, I actually wanted to bring that up. I just saw a commercial with Lando, Lil Yachty, Busta Rhymes for TikTok and Google Chrome. And it's like a three minute commercial. It's popped up on me YouTube a couple of times this weekend. That's actually kind of kind of super dope to me because it's like when you've taken your sponsor google chrome and you're talking about tiktok there's a whole it's a whole like they built a whole rap song around it based on blando's speed like based on like starting out slow like pace laps and all this stuff it was it was pretty interesting i'm excited to see more teams do that kind of stuff because i think that's where you're going to start to see a, a fan base that like I, I don't know like maybe this is just me being aspirational or, or a super nerd about sports fans. I love teams that the fans can influence the game. Like that is the most powerful thing where you go into, you know, uh, I don't know, like the Warriors had it for a while, right? Like there was a few seasons there where like you, you, you go to an over a Warriors game and like the fans are so loud. The Kings are like that in Sacramento the Giants off and on are like that. The Dodger fans are like that in L.A. Like fans that like are so passionate that like you almost can't you can't not try harder. You know, like you wouldn't be on the radio complaining about, you know, your team instructions because you know that the fans are there to, to cheer you on. And I think the only the, the only, you know, person on the grid that is really super hyper aware of the fan base is Lewis. He hundred percent pays attention to it, acknowledges it, talks to them every chance he gets. And like, that's something that I think adds layers to what these teams could do to tie this all back together. Like if you had a very charismatic leader at Ferrari, that fan base is just ready to go at any moment. And if they got somebody that was just, you know, like fired up like a Christian Horner or a Toto, or, you know, maybe it's funny like Gunther. Like, I don't know what the answer is, but I think that's the missing piece. And even though I'm not a Ferrari fan, so to speak, I would love to see that happen for them because that would just change the dynamics of the entire, you know, top three, in my opinion. Who's the most diehard fan base? Is it the Dutch Army or the Tifosi? Question right for you, Trevor. Tifosi. You think so? I think the, I think the Tifosi are the most loyal fan army out there. You know, they're going to be there. It doesn't matter if it's Nico Hulkenberg and Logan Sargent are wearing the Ferrari red. They're still going to be the passionate fans. And, you know, if, if Max disappears, the Orange Army disappears. So that's but, the difference. Kind of going into the generational conversation, don't you think that like the Red Bull brand is now ingrained into the Dutch Army so that they they've at some point it will be you know whenever Max retires, like he said, like oh I I could retire you know soon if if Formula One's not interesting to me anymore. I don't believe that, but say you know he gets championship number ten and he's like all right I'm done. Uh, you don't think that the next guy up for Red Bull will be automatically supported by the, the Dutch army? No. Nick DeVries yeah. just lost his career. If this was truly a Dutch army, he would still be on the grid. I think it's a Max army, and I think, to your point, Todd, it's a, it's a commentary on how sporting allegiances have changed because I think I would almost say pre-2005, everybody rooted for a team. It was sacrosanct to root for a player because then people would accuse you of being a dick rider or being some sort of weirdo fanboy. Now the conversation's almost flipped because of the fact that if I tell somebody I like Ferrari and when I say, yeah, I like both of them equally or I like Carlos a little bit more, I'm still kind of looked at, but like, oh, yeah, but who's your second favorite driver? I was like, well, I guess I like Esteban Ocon which I do, but it's one of those things that 
there is no right or wrong way to root for sports. Now, one other thing that Nick kind of mentioned in terms of that home field advantage, Formula One is the only sport in a way that it's non-existent and extremely existent at the same time because these fan bases travel. The best comparison I could make to that is college football. College football fans, especially those in the South, will follow their team from heaven to earth. That being said, I think when Max goes, unless baby Verstappen is right next to him as his number two driver, it's not going to happen. I think we're going to see a dwindling of the army. There's still going to be a passionate fan base, like you're saying, that they are going to figure out who the next one is from a Red Bull perspective. But if it's Daruvula, it might be the Indian army. And then who knows? Maybe I'll join Trevor and wear a Red Bull shirt as well in this episode. <laughs> That's a good point. Like, I, I just feel like it's he's going to have so many years of success in a row at Red Bull. Like, they are one and the same. And I couldn't see him ever driving anywhere else until he's done with Formula One. That I feel like it's going to. They're just going to be, by default, Red Bull fans if there's not another Dutch driver on the grid. Yeah, but I also and think I we live in an. No, I, I was just going to say, like, I don't think DeVries ever found his like he never did anything to earn the love of the dutch army he had one good race right last year when he subbed for albon and then this year's just been misery so he didn't have the the time to put in and he wasn't a phenom he didn't start the youngest or like he hasn't had that whole history his dad wasn't in formula one like he's max has the perfect storm to like make all these people red bull fans that was my point i totally see your guys side of it too like they where or Rohit, you put it perfectly. Like the the home field advantage is non-existent and literally insane at the same time. Yeah. So I have a question, Trevor. Like, how long have you been a Red Bull fan? Uh, probably off and on since the Vettel years. So that's whatever twelve years now. Yeah. I, I think it's. I think. Formula One is also really interesting because the drivers change teams so frequently, right? Like, you know, it's hard to be it's hard to be a fan of of a team like Red Bull that is also, you know, over time a Honda team, right? Like, you know, like my brother Aaron, who've been on the podcast before, both of them are fans of Honda before they're fans of Red Bull, right? And that kind of leads them into Red Bull because Honda's been providing engines for them off and on. Um, I think that that's another layer to the conversation that we're kind of having that, like, really, Ferrari is the only one, you know, that, that can kind of own that whole conversation through and through, right? I do kind of agree with you, Todd. I think that, you know, Max fans are going to be Max fans. I don't see, I, I don't see Red Bull fans, you know, I don't see Red Bull fans carrying on from Max, but it's, it's also like completely different when you're talking about like, you know, Lewis fans winning for eight years straight, you know, like that's, that's a different level of, of success where like, this is a terrible analogy and I don't mean this in any bad way, but it's like, you know, the Yankees winning all the time brings more fans to the fan base, you know, like they haven't won, but at some point you become so successful that people think you're winning, even when you're not winning, you know what I mean? Like it's kind of a crazy thing about sports that like the casual fans become, you know, like people are watching formula one for the first time a lot this year. Like we're going to see, you know, new fans from from all over the world. But like specifically, you know, like just thinking about America, there's going to be a ton of people at, in Vegas that have never paid attention to Formula One before. And if Max wins, they're probably going to become a Max fan. Right. And by default, Red Bull is is right there behind it. The downside to that and the reason why I kind of don't feel like they will carry on as Red Bull fans beyond this season beyond like this winning streak, whatever it ends at, right? Like you said, it could be 10 years whenever Max wants to hang it up. Like he will be one of the top drivers for the rest of his career, barring something bad happening. But like those people don't have some way, like, do, do you like, it's not like they're leaving the race and they're like, I got to go get a case of Red Bull, you know, like where like Ferrari fans, McLaren fans are like, 
I want to drive fast. I want to have that experience. Like this is the closest I can get as a normal human being to driving a formula one car. I'm going to go try to find whether that's an old Ferrari, an old McLaren, you know, whatever it is. Like there's a, there's a tangible connection between the cars that are driven and the reason that people can, can take that off the track and, and go have an experience that loops them right back into being a diehard fan. And I think that's the Tafosi, right? Like that's, that's it, right? Most people will never own Ferraris, but like the possibility is there and you can obsess over the street cars. You can obsess over the stories. You can obsess over all of those things that are so like just tried and true throughout the years where like most of the teams don't have that. So it's, to me, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine Red Bull because like, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I should be a Red Bull fan based on like, you know, like I said, Aaron and, and my brother being Red Bull fans. Cause I'm a diehard Honda owner, right? Like way too many Hondas throughout the years, way too many Hondas right now. Like, it's just like one, one of my obsessions, but like, if Honda comes in and is building engines or supplying whatever for another team, I'm way more interested in that than I am Red Bull, Max, and Ferrari as an engine supplier or whatever that could be. I know Red Bull is going to build their own engines and all that, but like, I'm just saying, like, if you take away the, the pillar of cars for me, I don't really have a reason to stick around. So that means by, if the math is going to math, you're going to be an Aston Martin fan next year or 26 Nick and then Trevor's going to go buy a Ford car because Red Bull <laughs> is going to be a F- Red Bull Ford I mean if it works it works I guess so going back to go, going back to the point of you know long term allegiance you know Ro- Rohit mentioned you know where Williams was a decade ago or 15 years ago now or whenever and you know I think the biggest point is they didn't have anything else to fall back on they were an F1 team you know Ferrari sold six billion dollars worth of cars last year and you know they're motivated and they're funded to keep keep pumping out those sports cars and you know, they're in a unique situation that way that, you know, the F1 team feeds the car brand and the car brand feeds the F1 team. And you have this generational, you know, my dad was a Ferrari fan, so I'm a Ferrari fan. And even if they've struggled for three years in fourth place, they recovered and they brought some new drivers in and and so on and i think for all these other teams if you're talking long-term success it's not about you know how good max or stappen does because if he retires in 2029 and red bull doesn't have another driver then the orange army is just going to disappear and go cheer on their their soccer team or their favorite cyclist or their you know whatever else because the orange army is more sports fans than they are f1 fans or soccer fans or cycling fans or whatever they are but they show up in droves to support their own and i think that's you know when you're looking at long-term planning you know, it kind of it kind of speaks to what Red Bull's trying to do with their young driver academy is they want to bring you know, they wanted to bring Vettel in and then they, they brought Max in and now now at some point they're gonna look for the for the next guy and you know, whenever that is. But it it's really tough to find generational talents and that's kind of where they're where they're at, you know, for twenty twenty four or twenty twenty five or twenty twenty six or whenever. Because you're right, Max isn't gonna stick around forever. I think the question other hard though, part I, of, go ahead. And I, I just are, so you are a Max fan or a Red Bull fan? I like, started as Red Bull fan, and now you just because Max has been this generational talent, you're like, yeah, he's he's my guy, right? Right. Okay. So so I became I became a Red Bull fan because of Same. Red Bull Enterprises and the fact that they you know they jumped. They they jumped people out of uh, a rocket ship and they had the Red Bull crashed ice and they and had the, the and you know, just all the crazy they, stuff they do. Right. They they had they had all the all the coolest extreme athletes in the world 
more Red Bull. And that is why I became a Red Bull fan because I was like, these guys are kind of, you know, the disruptor. And that's why I became a Red Bull fan. Okay. I just thought it was an important clarifying question because we talked about Seb quickly, but if you're, and then we were talking about allegiances, which I think is a really interesting conversation. Uh, and Ro, Ro brought it up earlier, but like, like I was a Seb fan and like a Danny Rick diehard, obviously, when he came into the sport. But like I and I drink Red Bull, so it's not like I have anything against the, the company or whatever, but I didn't like them as a team in Formula One. So it was hard rooting for Danny Rick and not liking the team. And I have always or it was weird, I guess, because I've always been a McLaren fan. But Danny Rick was my guy. So like having that like. It's not like you're in baseball, like a fan of like, you know, if you're a Yankees fan and like Mike Judge comes to the Yankees and then does something stupid and goes to another team, you're not going to follow Mike Judge necessarily. You know what I mean? Like it's so you don't have that in any other sport where it's pure idiocracy. Yeah, it's it's but weird. Again, I don't know. Aaron Judge. But again, Tom, Mike the Judge. Point is, oh, yeah. There you go. I don't. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Judge. Yeah. Aaron Judge. Anyway. <laughs> I thought of that because shout out to to Dalton because he was talking about in in the Discord shameless plug for the Discord he was talking about he's only paying attention to two things uh, his Pittsburgh Pirates and uh, Otani I think is his name yeah. right yeah. I won't even try to say his first name because I'll probably <laughs> show say that wrong Shohei yep and it's just interesting because you don't really see that in other sports where you're a fan of like Roe is a Ferrari fan but also a fan of Besty Bestie. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting, you know, like I'm definitely a fan of Red Bull and what they've done. Like uh, in particular, like the reason why I like the brand is because of the media house that that they built to like do all this crazy stuff. And, you know, they've magazines and content and like they've been on that for, you know, nearly 20 years now at the top of that game, you know, like I create content for a living. I have since 2007 in some way, shape or form, like, you know, not the podcast or anything like that, but like everything I do for work during the day is about that kind of stuff. And, and Red Bull has absolutely dominated that. And yes, they do the craziest stuff, but like at the end of the day, they also just have like a great team of people. They've always hired the best people to create content. And like, that's really like a completely different way to look at it, I think. And I, I just never looked at it that way, but I'm definitely a fan of the brand in that sense. To your point, Todd, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the team necessarily at this point, but like there's definitely times where, you know, I'd root for them. Yeah. You know, like with Seb, like I, w- I wanted to see Seb win, you know, like he just seemed like a good dude, you know, all, all along, you know, like I, I know all these guys and we talk about it a lot, but all these guys are kind of pricks their first couple of years because they have to be right. They have to prove that they are worthy of being there and also not going to back down from the rest of the pricks that they race with, you know, like at the end of the day, like it's kind of like the stroll conversation, ninth, 10th, 14th, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Your top 20 best driver in the world. Even, even if you can find some people outside of formula one that are better, you're still so much better than everyone else that thinks they can drive a car, you know, like, and, and it's so hard to comprehend how good these guys are until you get out and like actually see races. But I will say when you see Max get frustrated playing a gamer online and running him off the road and getting disqualified from the, from the, uh, uh, what was it? Like the, that was just some endurance. Yeah. uh, Racing endurance endurance stuff online. Yep. God, that was hilarious. And shout out to Max for doing that. Like yeah. knowing his reputation and his everything is under a, mi- a microscope. It's getting pissed enough to like get he got like pit maneuvered or something in, in, into a wall or whatever and got so pissed, went back in the pits or like rebooted, yeah. went, got back in the race, went from the pits and just sideswiped the dude. Amazing. Bravo. And I think that speaks to his competitiveness so much, you know, like he's such a like that's where when you're talking about how long is he going to race? I mean, look, if you're if you're competitive to that level, you, you know, Lewis is out there getting emotional because he 
you know, is back on the pole and, you know, 104 or whatever, 105, I can't remember what number it was, but like, that's a crazy thing. But like, he's so competitive and so driven that it's like, Hey, I had that record yesterday, but I also just beat it. And I'm back to this like feeling of, you know, winning again. And Max can say like, oh, I won't, I, maybe I'll be done with it. But like, look, until he has as many records as possibly can be held, he's not going to stop. There's just no way he's more competitive. I think than anybody on the grid. I think that's probably why he's winning. You know, he's got the best car, but he's also, he would also be, you know, it's hard to say that he's not the best driver out there, even without that car at this point. You could put him in a lesser car for sure. And I think he'd still be if like you put him in the, the, the formula 1.5 category, like the Mercedes, the, Aston's the Ferraris now the McLarens like I think he'd still come out on top of those those that crew almost all the time yeah so well just just the fact just the fact that he kicks kicks the butt of his teammate every single race tells you that he's getting more out of the car than anybody else is so like that that spread is is good and you know you guys were here whatever 12 weeks ago talking about how good Checo Perez is, has been in the first four races of the year. And, you know, now you look at what Max is doing to him. So I, I definitely think that, you know, he's kind of at the top of his game and he's kind of one of those people that just lives, dies, sleeps racing. And, you know, there might be guys like Alonzo and Hamilton that you could have, you can kind of describe that as, but he's he's kind of at the peak of his powers right now and i don't expect that you know the grid's going to catch up to him this year and you know we'll see about next year because er everything changes every year now which is which is kind of cool like every time there's a new car there's a chance that you know the grid gets shaken up a little bit but right now he's best car best driver and you know, I don't think anything's going to change. And, you know, he's won seven in a row, and now he's motivated to win eight in a row. So, so hot take yeah. question for the episode. Who on the grid right now put in the other Red Bull is going to give Max the most competition? Lando Norris. That's my first thought also, but I don't think Lando would like the pressure cooker situation that I, I I've made that joke a million times, but the whole chamber of fear Ferrari style that Red Bull seems to be. And I don't mean that they're the same way that like the mid two thousands actual chamber of fear Ferrari was when Schumacher was winning everything. Like they literally were like scared, scared to screw up. I think it's a much happier environment in the Red Bull garage, but I don't know if Lando would enjoy that environment in the Red Bull garage so much because it seems like no matter and I've never been in any of these teams, so I don't know for sure. But it seems like the last what, like three or four Max teammates have have come away from that situation feeling like they're getting less support than Max gets. So I, I feel like if there's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire there a little bit at least. So I don't think. Lando would uh, flourish. I think his skill levels is there, like right, right close to Max, with what he's been able to do in the last couple of years in the McLaren. The other person I would put is Alonso. He's so loud. He's so direct. He's so uh, like old journeyman. Like he doesn't won't take any BS. Like if Max is get, talking about this setup, he wants to be in Max's face. Like why are you doing that? Like. There would be no loose ends for him. It's Alonzo in the short run, right? That man prides himself on being able to get the most out of car, and if he doesn't have any support, it's seemingly in his mind he gets even stronger because he, it's truly him against the world whenever he races. From a longer-term perspective, I had an answer, and now it's forgot, I've forgotten it, which is saying something because there's really only 19 other answers. So let me get back to it. But short term, it's Alonzo, and it's not even close because not only that, he seemingly has the credentials to at least put a little bit of an inkling of a doubt 
with Max because I think we saw a couple incidences earlier this year where they were both kind of going for the same line. Neither one of them necessarily moved an inch, but they also realized this, there's a longer game to play, so I'm not going to do it. You're not going to do it. If it's a one-off race, there is nobody more dangerous to Max Verstappen's dominance than Fernando Alonso. Over the course of the season, I don't know yet. Come back to me in two minutes. <laughs> to, to, to be to be quite honest, my answer of Lando was would have been the same answer four weeks ago before McLaren fixed their car, and it would have been the same six months ago before the season started. Like, I just think Lando and Max's relationship, and you know Lando's ability to show outsized performance makes him attractive to somebody like Red Bull and you know for guys that weren't in a top three car I would I would assume that most people would vote that he's the best driver out there yeah. now, he, now he's got a top three car but you know if he wants to get if he wants to get paid or if he wants to try a different challenge or whatever that's a different story Nick before you give an answer can I throw a name out and just tell me why? Because I think the answer is apparent, but I want to get the three of yours to take. George Russell. So, so I just, I think it's interesting that, that none of us mentioned Lewis Hamilton. Like, I, I don't think that I would see him as like, you know, wanting to be competitive with Max on that level on the same team by any means but I think skill wise I think him in the Red Bull car would be as dominant as Max or very close to it I hope that Lando becomes as competitive with this McLaren car like that's still like I I think I'm more of a Lando fan than a Danny Rick fan I'm a McLaren fan like I just I think Zach Brown is great I think that it's just a really fun team, and I think that you see it when they start to win. Like, you see how genuinely excited they are. And, like, I know it's it's a little deep for just, like, a, you know, for a casual fan that might be listening, but, like, that that part of, of motorsports is my favorite. You know, when, when it's, like, the teams that, like, aren't supposed to figure it out start to figure it out. And, like, yeah, maybe you have Lando, who is potentially one of the best drivers in the world right now, but like you've still got to figure out how to get him a car. You've still got to, they were turning 2.2 second, you know, pit stops today. McLaren hasn't done that in like, I don't think ever, you know, like they are pushing like the limits of what the team is capable of. And like everybody's starting to believe that they are capable of it, which means they're going to continue to do that. So like, I think that's really interesting. And I think that the dynamic between Max and Lando, for people that don't know, they've been really close friends for quite a long time. They've raced against each other for, you know, most of their lives. I think that's really interesting. I do think George Russell, you know, aside from qualifying this weekend and, you know, a little bit of snafu with the team directions or whatever you want to call it, like he is one of the better drivers on the grid. But I don't see him... Uh, for some reason, he doesn't feel like he has that fire that Max has, that Lewis has, that Seb had, that Alonzo has, you know, and I, I think that's a really interesting piece to that dynamic. I really wasn't thinking about that whole big picture. You know, I was just more thinking of like, who's the best driver on the grid outside of Max? You know, like uh, to me, it's it's probably Lando. It's it's probably Lewis, a close second or if they're not equals um, in given the same car and the same, you know, um, you know, I, I would say like decent pit strategy and stuff like th- that kind of stuff. Those two are the two that come to mind for me as far as like actually working or, you know, qu- air quotes working alongside of Max. Yeah, 100 percent. It's Alonzo. It reminds me my 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 dog is the per- perfect example for this. So my dog is, you know, uh, <laughs> co- you know, a pandemic puppy had like a month of socializing before everything was locked down is completely scared and you know like mean towards most every dog on the planet now my brother has a dog that's 16 years old now like just does not give a shit about my dog at all and my dog will just like follow it around so ironically my dog my brother's dog's name is enzo my dog's name is mika 
Formula One, you know, just through the veins here. But basically, to what you were saying, Todd, Alonso is going to be the one that is like, yeah, you're the hot shit, but like, go fuck off, you know, like, piss off. I don't want to deal with you. And like, that probably is the perfect way to deal with Max, to be honest, because he's never had that. He's always been the best driver on that team, you know, for what? What is this? Six? Is this six? His sixth year at Red Bull? Like Longer. in the Red Bull car? No, he's. Yeah. He started at 16. His first race was 17. It's, he's 25 now. So eight years, I think. But he hasn't had real competition in a Red Bull seat consistently, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, only Danny, Danny Rick, Rick was good out at the end. Yeah. Yep. So he's never really had that, like, fight back personality next to him, which is really, you know, it's hard to say that it's a wrong choice in any way because they're winning, right? But, like, the transition to whatever's next for Red Bull is really kind of dependent on, like, who that person is. And to Trevor's point earlier, you said something about kind of, like, finding that up-and-coming talent, right, and, like, that generational talent. Red Bull cannot have the next generational talent. Like, the next generational talent is going to go head-to-head with Max and fight, right? That's why the Botas Lewis relationship worked, you know, like that's why Max and Checo kind of works because yeah, Checo is a great driver, but he's not like, he's starting to know he's ultra. Com- two. Yeah. He's not ultra competitive. He's not going to fight for that number one seat because at the end of the day, he knows that Max is, is the number one driver at Red Bull. But if you want the next generational talent, like you have to have that, t- you know, like, they have to have the ability to like, prove themselves as young as possible. Max was given that opportunity. I don't see... But they're not going to get a fair shake of it because Not Max at Red Bull, that's Max what I mean. Like, with, I just yeah, don't yeah. see it ever working at Red Bull, right? Like, no. Which is interesting. And I think one other thing, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost seems like the ideal team dynamic in Formula 1 is one seat you keep for your own internal training program, one is the seat that you try to get somebody else to jump ship and join you. And I think that's the model that I would assume most successful uh, Formula One teams would try to adopt because ultimately I understand that they've got the deepest young driver network. I would bet 24 Capri Suns that I don't think anybody from that young driver network is going to usurp Max Verstappen and the heir to Max, whoever that may be, is going to be an existing driver that Red Bull is just going to throw a blank check at. Nah, I disagree. Hardcore, I disagree on that. They had, they wouldn't invest so much money into the Red Bull Junior Academy if if I understand it was. that, but they've gone 0 for 6, right? Or how many have they tried to put right next to him to give him a competitive person? And it's yet to happen. And there's Granted, nobody in form. Mm-hmm. No, no, I was just going to say, like, they were trying to get what Mercedes has now. They're trying to do the Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers thing. But they, based on their team setup or whatever... They're, they, it hasn't worked out for whatever reason. But that's what they want. Like that's what Mercedes is doing right now with George and Lewis. They're they want that whole pass the torch thing, and and George to like in a few years become the number one, and and the next period of dominance or whatever. That's what they're trying to do in Red Bull, and I think they'll continue to do that because it has like it spawned Albon, good driver. It spawned, uh, uh, well, Kvyat was, I mean, he was Gasly good. Gasly you know. is a, a Gasly, average to, yep. Yeah, I think he's a solid driver. Um, they have Liam Lawson waiting in the wings. They have Saito. They have uh, Daruvula, you mentioned earlier. Like, these are all promising young talents. But I think the honest problem is with Formula One, it's like that lightning in a bottle. You have to have a good car at the right moment. Uh, with a with a robot like driver that ed- lives, breathes, eats, sleeps, <clears throat> racing. That's has to t- has all those ingredients for it, this to work. We're only Trevor, we're only a couple, like we're only that. we're only a couple of years away from a a a radical different car in Formula One. So, you know, to Rohit's point, yes, somebody could definitely beat Max that's already on the grid, like. Who knows? Haas could figure out the car before anybody else, and 
you know, their driver, whatever, Alex Palou could could win could win twenty twenty six. Like, you know, nothing is kind of out of the realm. But I, I do think that the reason these teams spend millions and millions of dollars on supporting F two and F three drivers is to try to develop that talent and that you know that pipeline that will continue to refresh their team like the hottest the hottest driver in the world is an italian who's on who's on mercedes who's on the mercedes junior team and you know he's a 16 year old who's in f3 or f4 right now but he's you know he's the guy that wins every championship he's in his name's antonelli anyways Every team wants that guy. They, they're looking for the next Max Verstappen. They're looking for the next guy that is going to hit the ground running and within a couple of years be taking world championships. And that's why, you know, Red Bull has eight juniors and, you know, Ferrari has six and Alpine has four and, you know, whoever. Like, the, all, these, all these teams invest in young drivers because they're trying to hit the home run. They're trying to find the next guy. So that that leads me to a question about kind of potentially the next guy, right? Like we, so we talk about Red Bull and their, you know, program. Um, Ferrari's, you know, program is, is very similar, right? Like, but it's like obvious that Alpha Tori and Red Bull are connected, you know, Toro Rosso before, like it's, it's clear that like that is the number two Red Bull team. And like, you know, like we even talked about last episode, it makes it more of a possibility that that Danny Rick actually takes Checo's place next year or whenever if Checo decides to leave. How does that work for Ferrari, considering that Oscar Piastri came up in the Ferrari driving you know camp, right? But Alpine. now, what's that? He was an uh, Alpine. Uh, he was an Alpine driver, but he was in. Piastri. He was in the Ferrari junior driver, whatever thing, right? I don't think so. I'll look it up. Thank you. All right. I, I'm betting Red Bull on this. I'm almost positive he was at some point. <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe not, point, maybe not long term. But that's actually my question is like, how, you know, like Red Bull has like cornered the market for a lot of these kids to like pull them into the driving academy, their driver academy early on. And then it's like, well, well, there's four seats available. No other team really has that, right? Like Ferrari has a number of, you know, like they all have junior drivers, right? But like no team has the like obvious four seats possible at Formula One at the level of Formula One, right? Do you think that is, do do you think that hurts these other teams? You know, like with, for instance, with Ferrari, right? Like if, if they wanted, you know, they're supplying engines to other teams, but like they don't have any way to like bring those drivers in other than just cold, hard cash at the end of the day. Right. Like they have to let them go on their way. Well, Leclerc came through alpha before he went to Ferrari. So there is, it's weird because it kind of works out in the sense that um, it's based on the engine manufacturer. It feels like a little bit like whoever supplies your engine, because uh, Ocon was originally a Mercedes driver. He went to Williams because of the Mercedes relationship for yeah. a year. Um, I think same thing with Lance going to Williams before he was in Aston or well in racing point and then Aston. So I feel like it feels like, and I can't confirm this, but it feels like it's based on the engine manufacturers, their pipeline. Like there's the obvious junior team, Alpha Terry, but again, they're supplying parts or like they, Use most of the same parts, et cetera, et cetera, like their Honda team, right? Um, but that's the way the setup feels to me. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I've seen in the recent history. Because, like, Mick came up in Ferrari, obviously, right? But then mm-hmm. drives for Haas. It's a Ferrari power plant. Now, if if Audi comes along and he goes there, like, what does that relationship look like? Because, like, Mick and Piastri were both in F2 at the same time, right? Or did Piastri replace... Is he a year no, behind? Yeah, you're right. He, uh, Mick was the la- the year that P- Piastri won F2. I think Mick got second or third in F2. Yeah. All right, Rowan, am, am, I, am I wrong with the 
Ferrari? All I could find on Oscar Piastri's Wikipedia page was... He partnered with Robert Schwartzman, who was a part of the Ferrari Driving Academy, and the only Italian link Piastri had was with the Prima Auto Group? Yeah, Prima, Prima is the F2 team. But I don't know. That was kind of irrelevant to the point you were making, yeah. Nick. I, I think he was at Alpine, and then this feeds back into our conversation. Is Alpine said they were like going to consider stop, stopping supporting junior drivers because of what happened or what they did to themselves in the whole contract negotiations. But I don't want to see, like... Sorry, go ahead, Trev. No, but to your point, like, all of these manufacturers have found places to place their junior drivers, right? Like, it's not out of the realm of possibility that, you know, Ferrari goes to Alfa Romeo and says, "We we need a seat for our superstar junior guy. Whenever your next opening is, we'll pay you whatever the whatever the number is, because it's probably not under, under the cost cap. And you know, you train our you train our, our guy just like just like uh, Mercedes did with uh, with George Russell, or w- what happened with you know Lance Stroll back in the days, or what happens with any of these guys, right? Like, there's only a certain number of seats, and if you don't have a seat, you try to find them a seat. Yeah. The one thing that we haven't t- touched on, but it was in, or much earlier in the conversation, Leclerc signed another contract with Ferrari. So I think Roe is Nostradamus and has called his shot with signs going to Audi. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to get on that hype train. So then who replaces him? We'll ask Trevor since he hasn't given us his opinion yet. Who goes to Ferrari to replace signs? Well, again... Like where's where's signs going? Like if he's going to Audi, that's twenty twenty six. So that's three years from now. So I think we're I think we're a long ways from you know making determinations on what the grid's going to look like in three years. You know I think status quo for Ferrari is probably you know what what twenty twenty four is looking like. Damn it, Trevor! Stop being sensible. Nobody no, likes. No, no, I just, I, I don't, I, I don't see Alfa <laughs> no, Romeo. I'm just giving you a hard time. I don't, I don't see Alfa Romeo dumping, you know, Botas or Joe just to to bring in Carlos Sainz as a placeholder for three years, and then he's going to spin his wheels and be really happy to finish thirteenth. Like that doesn't make sense. You know that team but, is I guess, it, that team's in, that team's in flux right now, and you know they're going through a leadership change, and you know until they're an Audi team, I I just don't see them being a relevant F one team. But the m- more their influence, like next year they're gonna they're not gonna run the Alpha branding. That they're gonna have something else. Um, the more that their influence starts to take, because they already own the team. They just aren't doing anything with it yet, but they're doing all this behind the scenes preparation. If I was Audi, I would absolutely, and my my goal was to get signs in. I would absolutely bring him in a year too early to get him used to the operations and the way Audi's going to be running this team to build it up for the future. Have him in the development of the car. Have him in the talks. If he, if he's my guy, bring him in in twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five to to build that team up like they did with with. Well, Max isn't a great example, but he was there from when the Red Bull had fallen off a cliff after the Seb days because they went from so, first to, like, fifth in the championship, I think, the next year. So why would Sainz do that? Because if they're promising him a world championship, this is your team, this is good. we're going to build it together, why wouldn't you? If, if he's truly that dissatisfied with Ferrari, which the way he talks to his engineer during the race, I kind of believe it. Well, so does so does Leclerc. How is, Le- Leclerc talks to his engineer the same way. He's like, you know, yeah, but that's just Ferrari's Leclerc, inept. Leclerc has been coronated as the guy for Ferrari. Like, for a lot of us that started this sport with Formula One Drive to Survive, that very first episode where we're introduced to him, it's all under the guise of Jewel. Uh, apologies if I mispronounced the name. I'm not trying to speak ill of the dead. Jules Bianchi's death, right? He's his godson. 
Jules Bianchi was going to be a Formula One driver for Ferrari, or was he a Formula One driver for Ferrari, and now Charles is completing that family legacy component of it. That's all we've heard. Not only that, I'll defer to you two if I'm speaking ill of this, but it almost always seems to the untrained eye, like I have an untrained eye, that more often than not, Ferrari tends to prioritize Leclerc over signs. Is that fair, or am I just imagining things? Uh, based on the last two and years, if, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah. Today was another example of that. Science right. was on and the soft that, on a much faster tire, and they kept him behind Leclerc. They didn't do team orders. Yep. Right. Why? And that's my point. It's like, to your point, if I had to make a comparison, in hindsight, it looks like a silly move that – Ricardo left Red Bull to go to Renault, but I think it's probably under the same whims and fancies that Todd just talked about, where it's like, we'll build the car for you, Danny. Let's tweak this to your driving style. Now, it didn't come to fruition, but at least that, to me, justifies that move that he made from uh, Red Bull to Renault at the time. And I would think it's a similar genre of move. Yeah, I'm, I, I agree with you, and I, I, I'm starting to, starting to believe the hype. On your call, Ro. And uh, Trevor, I know this sounds absurd because, you know, you, you've been doing this Formula One thing a lot longer than I have. But once again, my newbie impression is some of these contracts don't appear to be worth the paper that they're printed on. And yes, it may say that, hey, we have him till 2024. But as we've seen with Nick DeVries, as we've seen with Danny Rick, if they want you gone, they'll get you gone. Well, remember, the... Contracts are outside of the cost cap. So I'm sure if you just paid somebody to go away, it's still outside of the cost cap. So it doesn't really matter if you pay, you know, Daniel Ricardo twenty million to go away or Nick DeVries, you know, twenty seven dollars to go away or you know, whatever. Like it that that doesn't seem to be much of an issue the way that the sport is going now. If if they want you gone, they're just gonna write you a check and move on. Yeah, you know, it, I think it the other. Goes, it, sorry, Nick. It kind of Go goes back to the, you know, these 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 top teams used to spend two times, three times, four times the money that they're allowed to spend now. So they've still got oodles of money that they're allowed to spend. You know, the sport is in a much different place than twenty than it was in twenty sixteen, but you know. Red Bull and Mercedes and Ferrari spent four hundred million dollars on their cars back then. So, you know, they've they've got the money that they can make these problems go away if if that's what they want and if that's the decision that they want to prioritize for the future. So, yes, I, th- I think any contract is, you know, doesn't really matter going forward anymore. So I, ha- I have think- one point about the Carlos Sainz to Audi thing. Like I. I I think he's going to be fed up with Ferrari, even if he's got to go another year at Ferrari. There's like a slight possibility he lands at another team for a year or two, right? Like there's a good possibility Valtteri could decide to retire. You know, like there's there's all sorts of things that could happen. But the one thing that I think is really most interesting about Carlos Sainz to Audi is that his dad has been driving for them at the Degar rallies the last couple of years, which it would be really cool in my mind, if, you know, junior is racing and somehow dad is involved with the Audi team, you know, and to, to your guys' point about to row, it's point about the family element, right? Like this is a normal thing in formula one, right? Like the more family and friends you can bring on and, and be around, you know, the, the more you're probably going to enjoy racing. Right. So that would be a really interesting kind of, I don't know, uh, unspoken possibility, I guess. Like, it's not really like something you could put on paper as like, oh yeah, this is a possibility even, but like to, to Todd's point about, you know, like promising the world, Hey, if you promised me that I could race on my dad's team or a team that my dad was heavily involved in, that's definitely some, some extra weight in my mind. Trevor, the only other thing I think that gives me belief that I'm, hopefully predicting the future. I'll have enough self-awareness to say this isn't the gospel. But I also don't see anything from Valtteri Bottas this year that leads me to believe that he is long for this world. Like, he seems checked out in a way that even Seb Vettel is like, dude, are you good? Like, are you sure about this racing thing? (laughs) I I, I kind of agree with you, but I think he was brought there 
as a you know elder statesman to kind of you know go out to go out to pasture and uh, you know live live your old days and I don't I don't think I don't think the idea was that he was going to you know bring them to the forefront of the sport I think the the reason they brought him there was to help develop the team and to help develop his partner and if those things happen and if you know Guan Yu Zhou finish or uh, qualifies fifth at the Hungarian Grand Prix you know that's a successful that's a successful you know outcome for Alfa Romeo and you know they they've got to take these small wins as they come versus you know we're we're going to go straight to the front of the grid so i think that was their mindset and you know they're probably okay with that and then obviously things changed and they've been bought out and blah 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 but you know i think that that senior figure that that guy that can tell you how the how the big teams work is still an advantage to have one more thing to pile on to uh nick talking about carlos Sainz senior i looked up his wikipedia and discovered that he's been under the skirt of the vag group uh since 2007 uh 2007 he's been under the vw umbrella racing in their various rally dakar etc so maybe he's been planting the seed you know like hey get my boy a race seat yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see. All right, so we we got to wrap up. So, thirty seconds or less. What do we got? Belgian Grand Prix next. Spa. What are you guys' predictions? Guess first. Nostradamus. <laughs> You're on mute. This is how he's oh, one of us now. See? When he begins yep. his point, uh, yep, he's one of the club. Start gonna... talking on mute. I, I am gonna have a sunburn because I am sitting at Eau Rouge for the next uh, for the next race, so I will be there in person. So I'm I'm quite awesome. excited for for my uh, spa Grand Prix experience. So your top three, give us your top three. Uh, okay. Four weeks ago in the Discord, or three weeks ago in the Discord, I I I, I sent a lot of. Uh, I was I was very cautious on the McLaren upgrades and be like no I, I still don't, I, I don't believe they're true but after after what they've done on the the fast turns and now the slow turns I, I'm I'm all in so I'll go Max Lando and uh, third place I'm gonna say Fernando Alonso I think uh, I think they're gonna figure something out so I'll go those three. Bro, what you got? Yeah, I mean, Max is one. Uh, hmm. We haven't had a Ferrari podium in a while, it feels like. So let me give Max one, Carlos two, Lando three. And that's me being a fanboy. I'm blatantly admitting it, so don't worry about me. <laughs> what do you think, Todd? Uh, I'm going to say Max so far out front that for some reason they give Joss Verstappen P2. Um <laughs> No, uh, it'll be Max, Checo, Lewis. Lewis. Max, Jeez. Checo, Lewis. Ooh, I just don't okay. think the McLaren the, the McLaren is very fast in both high-speed corners and slow-speed corners now that we've seen, uh, but they're not super fast in a straight line. Uh, Mercedes seems to be um, somehow fast in a straight line, and they're good on the tires. I think uh, we'll see another Lewis podium. I think right. I think the biggest thing going forward before Nick gives his picks is it's kind of nice that it's not just two teams at the top or three teams at the top. Like you know now 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 we're at a situation where you know we've got anywhere from you know six to ten drivers that can podium every week, and you know I like the fact that. You know, Carlos Sainz could podium, or Alonso could podium, or Checo could podium, and you know we weren't at that situation not not that long ago. And you know, I want somebody to, to you know, Piastri. He's a rookie; he hasn't had a podium yet, but he's getting close. Yeah, that's a great point, and I I think that's you know 
so true. Like, I, I just feel like it, even though Max is winning and dominating, you know, I, I still think the rest of the racing and like having the possibility of, you know, three or four, five teams, you know, like somewhere around there. And like not based on like a crazy accident or something, you know, like it's not like Ocon, you know, last was that last year or two years ago where it's like, OK, you, you got to win. But that doesn't. Like is that a re- like yeah you got a trophy but do you get a win for that you know he gets you know, a win Terry for that. bowling balled, bowling <laughs> yeah. balled everybody um, listen Terry's just living his life come on <laughs> but I think I think you know I guess deep down I think Max is going to win next weekend but I'm going to bet against him only because I've been on the Lando getting a win train for two three years now I think it's going to happen I think Lewis is going to come in second I think Piastri is going to get his first podium. I hope you're right. I thought Lando was going to win this race, to be honest, because I thought Max and Lewis were going to run into each other, or at least fight each other. And But no, Piastri just had to swoop and take the whole yeah. damn thing out. Yep. All right, guys. All right. Thanks for another great episode. Uh, let everybody know how they can find you outside of the show. Uh, I'm... Uh, Iron Trev on all platforms. Come, uh, come visit the Sneaker History Discord and uh, talk, 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 talk a lot of chat in the uh, in the Formula One uh, area because uh, there's there's lots of talk going on and there's lots of Formula One junkies in here. So come, come, come visit. I'm gonna get some pictures from from Trevor at Spa next weekend too. You can find me on Twitter at Rohizi, on Instagram at Rodem13, OnlyFans, the Hindu Hammer. <laughs> There's so many. Oh, man. Oh, my God. Uh, I can't even follow that. Uh, d- dad Shoe, Jesus Christ. Uh, Dad Shoe, that's S H U E dot JPEG on Instagram. Dad Shoe underscore JPEG, I think. I don't know. Just follow Rohit. He's amazing. <laughs> Close enough. Close enough. Hey, we're also on threads too now. So if you guys want to follow us on threads, Exhaust Notes FM. Uh, the first link in the description will be to get you in the Discord. Doesn't cost you anything. It's a great place to hang out. Amazing people like Trevor. Thanks for coming on, Trev. We appreciate you. You can find me at Nick Ingvall everywhere. Uh, but yeah, Exhaust Notes FM on all the platforms. And how do we follow up the Hindu hammer? I don't know. We'll catch He'll you next time, guys. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>